Okay, so this is the fourth lecture on mood disorders, and I'm going to talk about the etiology of unipolar depression. So the three P's, predisposition, precipitation, and perpetuation. So to review, in the last couple of lectures, we've talked about identifying the symptoms of major depressive disorder or of a major depressive episode. And these are sadness and anhedonia, so lack of enjoyment, physical symptoms that affect appetite, sleep, energy level, and psychomotor activity, mental or cognitive symptoms like feelings of guilt, self-loathing, low self-esteem, indecisiveness, difficulty concentrating, and thoughts of suicide. We've talked about how depression is really heterogeneous and that different combinations of these symptoms can manifest in different people, how depression varies a lot in its severity and in how chronic it is or how likely it is to recur. In the last lecture, we focused on the rising rates of depression and suicide and talked about the debate over whether this reflects overpathologizing normal sadness or increasing exposure in this country to precipitating factors for depression. And we identified some of those precipitating factors as basically losses, interpersonal stressors, and just not having our esteem and belonging needs met. So in this lecture, I'm gonna talk about the etiology of depression. So we'll start with the biological predisposing factors and then integrate that with the environmental stressors that we've already talked about, how these precipitating factors interact with biological predisposing factors and then also with the cognitive and behavioral perpetuating factors that um, I'm going to talk about today. Um, in the in-class part of this, topic, we'll talk about the treatment of unipolar mood disorders with a focus on cognitive behavioral therapy. So there's sort of three general biological predisposing factors that I'm going to talk about, but all of these interact with each other. And all of them may relate to the same kind of underlying biological risk factors. So the first one we've already talked about in the context of seasonal affective disorder. This is chronobiology, um, or the way that our body stays in tune with the passage of time and with the time of day and time of year. So as we've talked about, the symptoms of depression involve disturbances in all kinds of bodily regulatory systems. All of them are regulated by the circadian cycle, which is the part of our, the um, processes in our brain that help to keep our bodily functions in line with the time of day and the time of year. But the most important, just potentially the most important disturbance in the circadian rhythm that relates to depression is sleep disturbances. So symptoms of depression can include both insomnia and hypersomnia, so not sleeping enough and sleeping too much. And there are specific alterations in the architecture of sleep in depression. So people who are in a major depressive episode go into REM sleep sooner which is a sign of sleep deprivation or that their body is not getting as much sleep as it needs. They also have a shorter duration of deep sleep. So there are alterations in the quality and quantity of sleep and depression. And there's a really um, like direct close relationship between sleep and depression in that we know that when someone is in a major depressive episode, sleep deprivation can temporarily alleviate that depression and temporarily restore their mood to euthymia. So when you take people who are in a major depressive episode and deprive them of sleep, have them stay up all night, the next day their mood returns to baseline, they become euthymic again. But as soon as they're able to sleep and start to restore their um, sleep debt, they become depressed again. So in seasonal affective disorder, this is an example of a seasonal fluctuation in mood symptoms and depression that's related to the amount of light exposure that someone is getting. As we've talked about, seasonal affective disorder involves atypical depression symptoms, um, including atypical sleep disturbance, so sleeping too much and difficulty waking up. Seasonal affective disorder has really specific precipitating factors. It's precipitated by not getting enough light exposure, which, um, dysregulates the body's production of melatonin. The body doesn't start producing melatonin at the right time and it continues producing melatonin after the time when a person wants to wake up in the morning. Melatonin production, having melatonin circulating in your body makes it difficult to wake up. It makes it difficult to concentrate. It makes you feel like you don't have enough energy. There is some evidence that the kind of first symptom of seasonal affective disorder, the first sign that it's happening is the sleep disturbance. 
So before all the other symptoms of SAD, seasonal affective disorder start, like um, changes in appetite, changes in mood, changes in energy level, the first thing to change is changes in sleep, so hypersomnia. Sleep is controlled by melatonin, and melatonin is actually a breakdown product of serotonin, which we're going to talk about a lot in this lecture. So serotonin and the monoamine system are implicated in the circadian regulation of sleep. OK, so the monoamine system. When talking about depression, you've probably heard of serotonin and how it relates to the treatment of depression. Serotonin is the molecule that most common depression drugs primarily act on. Serotonin is actually not the only molecule that's implicated in depression. Serotonin is one of four, but really three, um, monoamine neurotransmitters. The, the key monoamine neurotransmitters are serotonin, norepinephrine, which breaks down into epinephrine, and dopamine. So looking at this Venn diagram, you can see that the functions that are regulated by each of these monoamines are pretty much the same functions that are disturbed in a mood episode, both depression and mania. All three of these uh, monoamine neurotransmitters have a role in regulating mood, as well as in regulating cognitive functioning and concentration. Serotonin and dopamine are also involved in appetitive drive, so our motivation to do things that we like and the enjoyment that we get out of them, including sex and eating. Uh, norepinephrine is really involved in maintaining our energy levels, um, and dopamine and norepinephrine together are both involved in motivation. Motivation, just like not feeling like you're not being able to get yourself to do things, having to force yourself to get up, having to force yourself to eat, having to force yourself to work. That's one of the key symptoms of depression that all four of the first person perspectives kind of addressed. So the monoamine neurotransmitters they regulate the functions that are disturbed in depression. So it's pretty clear that there is a relationship between depression and the monoamine system. The way that we discovered this relationship and the way that we discovered what the monoamine neurotransmitters actually do in the body kind of started by accident. So I'm just gonna give a very brief history of our understanding of the monoamine system starting in the 1950s. Oops, sorry. So we're gonna start with reserpine, which was a drug derived from um, the snake root plant, which is what this is, that was originally used to treat high blood pressure. In the 50s, it was found that reserpine actually seemed to cause people to become depressed when they were taking it. And it was known that one of the actions of reserpine was that it depletes monoamines in the brain. It makes the um, production of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine less, so that there's less of those neurotransmitters available in the synapse. Around the same time, a different drug was found to have the opposite effect on mood. So a tuberculosis drug was found to lift the mood um, and improve the cognitive functioning of tuberculosis patients who were also depressed. This drug was the first monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Um, one of the functions in the brain was that it inhibited the, mono, the monoamine oxidase enzyme, which is an enzyme that breaks down neurotransmitter or monoamine neurotransmitters in the synapse. So when the monoamine oxidase enzyme is inhibited, it's doing that job less. It's breaking these neurotransmitters down less, which makes them more available in the synapse. So reserpine depletes monoamines, and this tuberculosis drug um, increased the availability of monoamines. Around the same time, too, tricyclic antidepressants were um, originally prescribed as antipsychotics, but they were also found to have an effect on depression, and tricyclics also interact with the monoamine system. So all three of these drugs were prescribed for something else, but they were found to affect mood. And when scientists actually studied what these drugs were doing in the body, it was found that all of them interacted with the monoamine system. And that roughly decreasing monoamines in the brain seemed to make mood worse and increasing the availability of monoamines in the brain in people who are depressed seems to make mood better. So Based on these sort of accidental findings in the 50s, scientists started studying the monoamine system and the implications of um, interacting with the monoamine, sorry, and the implications of drugs that interact with the monoamine system in treating depression. So it was known that drugs that decrease or increase monoamine levels in the brain affect mood. 
And so we basically just inferred that because giving someone drugs that influence monoamines affects depression, endogenous processes that affect the availability of monoamines must cause depression. This theory, this hypothesis was supported by evidence from clinical trials that when you give patients with depression drugs that interact with the monoamine system, so monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, relative to placebos in moderate to severe cases, giving these drugs does improve people's depression. So again, thinking back to the video, giving people who are not depressed drugs that interact with the monoamine system doesn't change their mood. These drugs don't treat normal sadness. It really does seem like they have a specific function in treating whatever is going wrong in the brain of people who are depressed. That's why they only separate from placebo in moderate and severe cases. Because in mild cases, although some of them do reflect the true psychopathology of depression, many people who are diagnosed with mild depression are actually misdiagnosed and may just have normal sadness. So in the 1980s and 90s, um, in the late 80s actually, the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drug came on the market. And this was a huge um, milestone in psychiatry and the treatment of depression because compared to monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclic antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have very few side effects. These drugs are much easier for patients to take. They are less risky. Um, they're harder to overdose on. It's not as easy to use these drugs in a suicide attempt as it is to use monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics. Also with monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics, there's lots of dietary restrictions. There's lots of things that you can't eat. Um, and there's lots of unpleasant side effects that SSRIs really minimize. So the fact that there was now this more acceptable, easier to tolerate, safer drug available that had some evidence that it treated depression, this kind of started a craze of prescribing SSRIs. And that was talked about in the video that we watched in the lecture on what is and isn't depression. When someone comes into the doctor feeling sad, a lot of primary care physicians and also a lot of psychiatrists think, well, SSRIs are pretty harmless. So if this is depression, it will help them. And if it's not depression, it won't hurt. So the availability of SSRIs definitely did increase the diagnosis of depression. It made, it made physicians and psychiatrists more likely to diagnose someone with depression when they had a drug that they could give them to treat depression. So just like monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors increase availability of serotonin in the neural synapse. Um, the model originally for all monoamine, or sorry, for all um, drugs that interact with the monoamine system is that when people are depressed, it must mean that they have an imbalance in their monoamine oxidase production. It must mean that they're not making enough endogenously. So we have to give them more. And by giving them more, we're gonna correct, correct that deficit and improve their mood. But sort of simultaneously with the development of SSRIs and Prozac going on the market, we were starting to realize that there isn't such a clear relationship between serotonin and other monoamines and depression. You can't give someone a blood test, find that they have low serotonin and diagnose them with depression. And in fact, we've talked before about how having two short copies of the serotonin transporter allele is a risk factor for depression in the context of childhood stress. Well, having two short copies actually means that someone has more serotonin available in the synapse because what the serotonin transporter allele does is it takes serotonin out of the synapse and back into the neuron. So exactly what SSRIs are stopping um, by inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, people who have two short copies of the allele, their brain is naturally doing that. So if not enough serotonin was the cause of depression, you would think that in fact, two copies of the short transporter allele would make people less vulnerable, but we know it makes them more vulnerable. On the other hand though, there is some evidence that some people with severe depression or who've completed suicide do have less serotonin. There were a series of studies of the cerebrospinal fluid of people who had completed suicide. And these found that the more suicide attempts someone had in their life, which was an indicator of the chronicity and severity of their depression, the lower their levels of serotonin were when they were dead. So there's this conflicting evidence that kind of goes both ways. Drugs that raise the level of serotonin seem to improve depression, but having this genotype that also raises the level of serotonin makes someone more vulnerable to depression. And although there's no blood test that can show someone with low levels of monoamines has depression, 
on autopsy, people who are severely depressed and people who complete suicide on average do tend to have lower serotonin. So this is just a, a quick visual of the serotonin cycle and a reminder that like all neurotransmitters, serotonin is synthesized in the body. Our brains make it. And we get the building blocks of serotonin, the ingredients for it from our diets. So you've probably heard of tryptophan. Um, it's in turkey and other poultry, but it's also in other protein containing foods like eggs, fish, especially in legumes. Um, in our digestive system, tryptophan is broken down and then it's broken down further in the brain into serotonin. And the ultimate breakdown product of um, tryptophan is melatonin, which highlights an overlap between the monoamine hypothesis and the chronobiology hypothesis of vulnerability risk for depression. So we kind of have these mixed findings on the role of serotonin in depression. On the one hand, giving people drugs that increases its availability does seem to improve depression in clinical trials. But on the other hand, on an individual level, the amount of serotonin someone has in their body doesn't tell you anything about how depressed they are. And people with a genotype that causes them to have more serotonin available in the synapse are more vulnerable to depression when they have a lot of life stressors. So right now in the field, there are two, not necessarily competing, but two different hypotheses about the role of serotonin as a predisposing factor for depression. One is the permissive hypothesis, which is that we know that serotonin signaling, one of the things that it does is it helps to regulate the signaling of norepinephrine and dopamine. So all three of these monoamines have roles in mood and cognition. Dopamine has roles in motivation, norepinephrine has roles in energy and anxiety. All of these things are implicated in depression and serotonin seems to help balance out the functioning of norepinephrine and dopamine. So the, the theory is that when serotonin is low, but also potentially when serotonin is too high, this allows for either too much fluctuation in the other amines or potentially too little fluctuation and too little um, activity of norepinephrine and dopamine. So having either too much or not enough serotonin, having a serotonin system that's not functioning properly messes with the balance of norepinephrine and dopamine. And this leads to alterations in mood in both directions. It leads to vulnerability to depression and also to mania. In terms of drug development, um, since the 2000s, drugs that have more specific effects on the reuptake of norepinephrine and the reuptake of dopamine have come on the market as treatments for depression. So it's not just serotonin. Um, increasing the availability of norepinephrine, which is what the drug venlafaxine does, and increasing the availability of dopamine, which is what the drug bupropion does, have also been shown to help depression. So all of the monoamines are involved. We know that depression regulates their activity. So the permissive hypothesis is that problems with serotonin signaling lead to downstream problems with norepinephrine and dopamine signaling. The other hypothesis is the undirected susceptibility to change hypothesis. And this is that Serotonin isn't like good or bad. It, it doesn't have a one-to-one -one relationship with mood. What it does have a relationship with is neuroplasticity. So how good your brain is at learning from and reacting to the environment. Or another way of thinking about that is how much does the environment impact your brain? Higher serotonin levels don't necessarily lead to better mood, but they do lead to neuroplasticity. And this can have good or bad effects. In the context of repeated stressors, it's possible that having more serotonin makes you more vulnerable to the negative effects of stress on the brain. And that can create risk for depression as in the case of people with two short copies of the transporter allele. On the other hand, we know that giving people monoamine drugs when they're in another kind of treatment for depression, like when they're in cognitive therapy or when they're receiving light therapy seems to enhance the effectiveness of these other therapies. Cognitive therapy in particular involves learning new ways of thinking. So taking a drug that enhances neuroplasticity seems to enhance learning and it enhances the beneficial impact of cognitive therapy. So these are kind of the two competing or potentially um, sorry, I'm blanking on the word, but um, sorry, competing or potentially complementary hypotheses about the role of serotonin and the monoamine system in general in mood disorders.
so that was kind of complicated. And sorry, this is actually not the end of the biological predisposition section. This is just the end of the serotonin and monoamine section. Um, but what we know basically is that we know for sure that stress precipitates depression. There's a ton of evidence that a majority of depressive episodes, especially first episodes of depression, were preceded by some kind of life stressor. We also know that both chronic stress and chronic depression have neurotoxic impacts on the brain. And they're also physically bad for the body. Chronic stress leads to inflammation. It leads to immune system overactivity that down the line can lead to chronic health problems and poor immune functioning. So chronic stress and chronic depression both lead to greater biological predisposition to future episodes of depression. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next couple slides. Circadian dysfunction or disruptions in sleep can be both predisposing or precipitating factors. So someone who has a circadian system that is not good at flexibly changing its um, activity according to someone's um, actual behavior. So when someone is waking up before the sun because it's winter, a more flexible circadian system can start to um, suppress its melatonin production sooner and it's less reliant on the sun to have that effect. Someone with a less flexible circadian system is more prone to seasonal depression because they're trying to wake up and function at a time when their brain is not able to, um, to suppress melatonin production because it requires more sunlight and more external input to do that. We also know that um, sleep disturbances can cause circadian imbalances that chronically not sleeping for reasons that have to do with like your schedule or life stressors can lead to greater circadian dysfunction. And this can lead to the onset of depression. And we also know that the monoamine system is involved in an important way. We're just not sure of the exact mechanisms through which environmental stressors, the monoamine system, their circadian system, and the HPA axis, which we'll talk about in a second, actually interact to lead to either first episodes or recurrent episodes. And this is just a really active area of ongoing research. Um, but the takeaways for you guys is that stress is important. Um, melatonin, or sorry, well, yes, melatonin and the circadian system and sleep are important and the monoamine system is important. So like I said, an individual person's monoamine levels don't tell you anything about their mood. Um, there's no biological test for depression. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between monoamine functioning and mood. That's because monoamine functioning is an example of genetic vulnerability or diathesis. It's an indicator of how much risk you have for depression, but that risk has to be activated by the environment. So alterations in monoamine functioning, chronobiology, and HPA axis imbalances don't cause depression on their own. The risk has to be activated by environmental stressors. And the serotonin transporter allele polymorphism is an example of that. So again, two short copies of the serotonin transporter allele actually means that serotonin is not being brought back into the, into the um, presynaptic neuron as quickly, which means that there's more available in the synapse. It is the less functional version of the allele though. Um, the more beneficial adaptive version of the allele is the long version, which moves serotonin out of the synapse faster. And this allows for the brain to, um, for the, the serotonin system to have more time sensitive, time limited responses to the environment. But the short, short polymorphism means that there's more serotonin in the synapse. And this is a risk factor for depression, but only in the context of either chronic stress in childhood or repeated stressful life events throughout life. So this basically, the takeaway from this is that the functioning of the serotonin system interacts with environment, with the environment, with life stressors. Neither life stressors alone nor serotonin system functioning alone usually is enough to produce depression. So the last biological predisposing factor we're gonna talk about is HPA axis dysregulation. This is also known as the inflammatory theory of depression. So we talked about the HPA axis in the anxiety disorders unit. What it mainly does is it helps our body react to acute stress. The brain registers stress and it sends signals into the body, into the adrenal cortex 
that cause the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Cortisol is the hormone that causes our body to have a stress response. It's also a hormone that's involved in our body's immune system response. One of the things that it does is it creates a pro-inflammatory state in our body. This allows our body to be more effective at fighting off um, invading bacteria and viruses, but it's also hard on our organs and our um, vascular system to be in this state of inflammation. So in a healthy functioning body and in someone who's in a safe environment, the HPA axis should have a temporary time-limited self-limiting response. One of the other effects of cortisol in the blood is that it should go back into the pituitary and back into the hypothalamus and send inhibitory signals. So when cortisol binds to the neurons that release ACTH or CRF, what cortisol does to those neurons is it inhibits them and it tells them to stop producing CRF and ACTH. This basically shuts off the HPA axis and tells the body to stop producing cortisol. Chronic stress causes a breakdown of this negative feedback loop and it can put the body into a state that's known as hypercortisolemia, which is when the body is chronically producing cortisol and it's constantly in an inflammatory state. This is really hard on the, on the body. It can lead to metabolic problems. It can put someone at greater risk for developing diabetes. It's hard on our vascular system. It can put someone at risk for heart disease. And it's hard on the immune system. It makes you more likely to get sick. There is actually a biological test for hypercortisolemia. It's not a test for depression because there are other conditions that can cause hyper, hypercortisolemia, um, like especially thyroid problems but this is known as the dexamethasone suppression test. Um, and it basically can test whether your body has impaired negative feedback inhibition. So one biological vulnerability that is a shared biological vulnerability between anxiety and depression is having an HPA axis that's really sensitive to stress. If this response is going off more often than is normal, than it does for other people, that can put you at risk for impaired negative feedback because the more often the system is activated, the weaker the negative feedback becomes. So the monoamine system is also implicated in the HPA axis. Norepinephrine is involved in regulating the functioning of the HPA axis. Um, norepinephrine receptors in the hypothalamus actually help get this whole um, cycle going. Norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter that is used to signal to the hypothalamus that there's a stressor going on and that the hypothalamus should start producing CRF. So like I said, hypercortisolemia is hard on the body. It's hard on the organs, hard on the metabolism, the vasculature, the immune system. It's also hard on the brain. So there are cognitive symptoms of depression and having long-term depression is associated with memory and learning deficits. Cortisol damages cells, including neurons, and the cells in the brain that are the most affected are those in the hippocampus, which if you remember is the part of the brain that's involved in memory formation and memory retrieval. So there is some evidence from animal studies that giving animals that have been exposed to chronic stress, SSRIs can actually reverse hippocampal volume loss that's caused by chronic stress. This is an example of how SSRIs promote neuroplasticity. One aspect of neuroplasticity is the growth of new neurons. So one of the differences between first episode or um, single episode depression and chronic recurrent depression is the effect of depression, neurotoxic stress on the body. So in a first depressive episode, there's no impact of depression on the size of the hippocampus. These are comparisons between people with depression and people without depression, people who've never had depression in um, the volume of their hippocampus. So this is something that you can measure in an MRI. And what this is showing is that there's no statistical difference in the size of the hippocampus between people who are in their first depressive episode and people who've never had a major depressive episode. However, when you look at people who have either chronic or recurrent depression compared to people who've never had depression, people who have chronic and recurrent depression have smaller hippocampal volume. So what this is showing is that not just chronic stress, but also chronic recurrent depression, which produces a state of hypercortisolemia, it keeps the body in a constant state of inflammation and stress activation, has neurotoxic effects on the brain, it changes the structure of the brain. And specifically, it reduces the size of the hippocampus, which has implications for our, abil our ability 
to learn new things, to form new memories, and to retrieve existing memories. So this is just further evidence for neurotoxic stress. Um, this is, I believe, yeah, this is an MRI study looking at the linear relationship between how long someone has had depression without treatment and the size of their hippocampus. And what this is showing is that there's a negative relationship. So people who've had the longest duration of untreated depression, this is in days, have the smallest hippocampal volume. We actually start to see this hippocampal volume loss with either more than two recurrent episodes or at least two years of chronic depression. So again, thinking about the heterogeneity of depression and the implications that has for prognosis, only chronic and recurrent depression seem to have this neurotoxic effect. So that suggests that these are more serious um, damaging forms of depression. So getting back to something that we've been talking about a lot in this class, the environmental precipitants of depression. So we know that losses and chronic stress both precipitate depression. These maps are giving an example of how one chronic stressor, poverty, is associated with increased incidence of depression. We also know that the biological predisposition to depression is activated by both severe and chronic stress. So in terms of the monoamine system, the short, short allele, um, the short, short serotonin transporter allele vulnerability to depression is only activated in people who have chronic stressful life events. Stress interacts with the circadian system, potentially by causing sleep disturbances. So when people are experiencing stressful life events, that influences their sleep. It causes them to sleep less, and that can create circadian um, dysfunction. It can cause the circadian system to lose its regulatory control over all the other functions that are implicated in depression. It can loosen the circadian system's control over appetite and energy level and um, sleep. And then lastly, the neurotoxic stress hypothesis suggests that both chronic stress and major depressive episodes themselves increase the body's vulnerability to stress and to future episodes of depression by causing dysregulation of the HPA axis and by causing via this hypercortisolemia damage to the hippocampus. Hippocampal damage is a risk factor for future depression. So that's kind of a lot of information. And really the most important thing to remember is that there's a reciprocal relationship between depression and stress. Depression itself is a stressful life event. First episodes of depression are more likely to have clear environmental precipitants than recurrent episodes do. So once someone has already been depressed, that creates its own kind of predisposition. It creates greater biological vulnerability to future depressive episodes. And it means that the stressor that precipitates future, future depressive episodes can be less intense, less severe, um, and it can still precipitate depression. This is known as kindling. So the effect of depression on the body via neurotoxic stress kindles future depressive episodes. It creates a state, a biological state in the body that makes the body more prone to depression. Okay, so those were some of the predisposing factors and also predisposing factors that kind of consistently interact with environmental precipitating factors with stress. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a typo and I'm actually gonna fix it while we're talking because it's important. These are perpetuating factors. So kind of as a quick overview, we're gonna talk about these five perpetuating factors of depression. So learned helplessness is a concept we talked about a little bit early on in this class. Learned helplessness is an early animal model of depression that came from studies that found that if you put dogs in stressful, painful situations that they can't control or escape from, the dogs will stop engaging in their natural escape behaviors. So if you put dogs in cages that have electrified floors and give the dogs no way to escape from um, the shock that's coming from the floor, the dogs will stop trying to escape. They'll stop jumping when they get shocked. They'll stop scratching at the bars. They'll stop trying to get out. And then key to this experiment is that after a while, when the dogs have been exposed to this chronic uncontrollable stress for long enough, 
if you give them a way to escape, if you open the cage door, or if you make a lever available that they've already learned they can press to open the cage door, they won't try it. They won't try to get out. They've learned that their efforts to escape, their efforts to improve their situation don't work. So it's adaptive. It makes sense not to keep wasting your energy doing something that you've learned won't be rewarded with escape. In human terms, learned helplessness can be a cognitive and behavioral result of chronic stress. If you are exposed to chronic stressors and everything you try to do to improve your situation has been unsuccessful, this can lead to things like apathy, depressed mood, and feelings of hopelessness. And at a cognitive level, it can lead to thinking, I can't do anything to help myself or change my situation, so I just kind of give up. I'm going to stop trying to improve. Learned helplessness in humans can create new ways of thinking about the world that make people vulnerable to depression and that perpetuate depressive states that can be that are caused by chronic stress. So as we talked about in the GAD lecture, when we introduced cognitive distortions, as humans, we're constantly telling ourselves stories and interpreting the things that happen to us to help us explain the events in our lives. Another word for this is attributions. So these are our causal explanations for why something happened the way it did. Um, I, this would be like, I got in a car accident because I was texting and driving, or I failed the test because I didn't study. Or it can be attributions about positive things that happened to us. Like I got the job because I interviewed really well. But having a negative attribution style is a cognitive distortion. It's a tendency to consistently make negative attributions about why things happened. And specifically negative attributions are internal, stable, and global. Okay, so this is an example of a negative attribution style. Sorry. <laughs> I was in the pool! I was in the pool! <laughs> okay, so how is that a negative attribution style? So the woman who came into the room made a um, a stable attribution about what she saw. When George wanted her to make a more situational attribution about it. To her, what she saw represented what the situation is always like. Whereas to him, he knows that the situation changes and fluctuates and that it responds to the environment. So what's going on right now isn't a permanent condition. It's not stable. It's because of an environmental influence that he was in the pool and the water was cold. Okay, so to back up, Internal attributions are when you blame yourself for things that go wrong, when you believe that things going wrong is your fault. Stable attributions is when you believe that the underlying cause of negative life events is permanent, it can't change, nothing you do will make it different. Global attributions are when you believe that the cause of a single negative event applies to all similar events um, or things that could happen in the future. So more maybe relatable examples of this would be failing a test. An internal attribution would be, I failed this test because I didn't try hard enough. A stable attribution would be, I failed this test because I'm not smart enough. Being smart or not is a stable thing. No amount of effort or work is necessarily gonna change that. A global attribution of failing a test would be, I suck at everything. I always fail at things that I try. I'm gonna fail every final, I'm in every class this semester. An external attribution for that same event would be something like, well, I failed this test because the test was really hard, or I failed this test because the instructions were really unclear. A less stable attribution would be, I failed the test because I didn't study hard enough. That's something that you can change, as opposed to, I failed the test because I'm stupid. Or I failed the test because I had a lot of other things going on and I just didn't have time to study. That's a temporary situation that won't necessarily apply to tests in the future. Um, a global, a less global attribution would be, I failed the test in psychology, but most of my other classes are in subjects that I actually like better. And so because I failed the test in psychology doesn't really mean anything about whether I'll fail the tests in those other areas. 
So again, this video is an example of someone making a stable attribution about something that is actually more influenced by the environment than she gives it credit for. Never mind. Okay, so here's another example of how a negative attributional style can um, affect an interpersonal event. So say that you live with your girlfriend and she's mad at you because it was your turn to do the dishes, but you didn't do them. So an internal attribution about her being mad at you is this is all my fault um, because I'm so lazy and selfish. And this is why things won't work out and she'll eventually break up with me. So making these attributions influences the way that you feel, just like cognitive distortions about life events influence your emotional and behavioral responses. So the emotional responses to this life event that are influenced by your attribution of it might be that you feel help, hopeless about the future and that you feel a lot of self-loathing because you think that you're a lazy and selfish person. But if you're making a stable attribution, there's less incentive to try to change your behavior. If the reason your girlfriend is mad at you is because you're just a bad person or just because you're a lazy person, then there's really nothing you can do about that. That's just the person that you are. Another behavior that might come out of it is that because you think that things will never work out and she's gonna break up with you anyway, you might stop putting effort into the relationship and you might become kind of withdrawn and distant. And these are all very realistic behaviors that people with depression might engage in in relationships because of negative attributional styles, because of this cognitive distortion through which they filter life events. So these are other examples from people on Reddit. So pe real people talking about their depression. So this first person describes themselves as a failed student with no joy in life, no prospects and no future. So a failed student is a stable attribution, not I'm not doing well in school right now, but me as a student, I'm a failure. No joy in life, no prospects, those are global attributions. This other person also calls themselves a failure. Calling yourself a failure is a pretty common stable internal attribution. This person says they've been taking a bad path in life and they can't escape because of the time they've lost. So they're hopeless about the future because they're making a global attribution that because they're on this path now, it means that this is how it's gonna be forever. This last person says, I don't wanna subject my partner to having to deal with the mess that I am. So the mess that I am is an internal attribution. It's not my life isn't going very well right now or I'm in a depressive episode, but I'm a mess. And because they're making this attribution, they're kind of already dooming their relationship to some extent because they're having these thoughts that, you know, this relationship isn't gonna work out because I'm a bad person and my partner is a great person. And so inevitably this relationship will fail. Um, it is important to note that negative cognitive styles aren't necessarily inaccurate. In the social anxiety disorder lecture, we talked about the Lake Wobegon effect where most people will say that on average, they're above average at things. So if you ask a bunch of people if they're good at driving, more than half of them will say that they're above average at driving, which is statistically unlikely because most people are average at most things. People who are depressed are less likely to have this cognitive bias. They're less likely to rate themselves as above average at tasks. And in fact, people who are depressed are more accurate judges of their own performance and their own abilities. So having good self-esteem, being euthymic, not being depressed, means that you have a bias towards overestimating yourself, thinking that you're better at things than you really are. So going back to the adaptive functions of sadness, sadness is a normal response to a loss or a role change or not having your needs met. So when you're in a sad state, it actually kind of makes sense to be a little bit more realistic about your, availabil your abilities as you're evaluating, like what role did I play in this setback I experienced? Why am I not getting my needs met? Is it because I'm not doing enough? So depressive realism isn't necessarily inaccurate. And when sadness is adaptive, it may actually be helpful. This might be one of the functions that sadness evolved to help humans accomplish. Thinking back to some of these biological predisposing factors, so the hippocampus is involved in making new memories, but it's also involved in retrieving old memories. It's involved in 
helping us remember things from our past. This is known as autobiographical memory. People with lower hippocampal volume, people with hippocampal damage caused by chronic stress and depression are more likely to have difficulty retrieving memories from their past. And the difficulty that they have actually causes them to have overly general autobiographical memories. They kind of remember broad themes from their past, but they're not as good at remembering specifics. And this maps on to making global attributions. So rather than thinking back on specific times that you failed at something, having overly general autobiographical memory makes you remember everything in the past as failure without being able to pick out specific instances of failure and specific instances of success. So again, negative attributional style is just an example of a cognitive distortion. And people with depression are vulnerable to the same cognitive distortions that people with anxiety are. Whereas people with anxiety are in this kind of anxious mood state, so they're more likely to have cognitive distortions that magnify their anxiety. People with depression who are in a sad or anhedonic mood state are more likely to have cognitive distortions that magnify those moods. And if you look at the cognitive distortions on the handout in Canvas, you'll see that a lot of them really are internal. So labeling, I'm a bad person, personification, this is my fault, stable, um, so again, I'm a bad person, and global, so like catastrophizing, things are gonna go terribly, things always go badly for me, people are not going to like me because they never do. So just like cognitive, just like other cognitive distortions, having a negative cognitive style influences the way that we perceive events in our lives, and it makes us biased towards perceiving them negatively and reacting to them in ways that enhance negative mood and also promote behaviors that are consistent with sadness, like withdrawing, not taking risks, not doing things, not engaging in social activity. So some examples of um, internal stable and global cognitive distortions are jumping to the thought that things won't work out for me. I always get rejected. So overgeneralization, um, I'm a failure labeling, and it was my fault. Um, so personification, always blaming negative life events on yourself rather than considering the role of other people or random chance or the environment in explaining negative things that happen to you. Um, let's make sure this is recording. Okay, it is. Okay, so the next perpetuating factor in depression. So the next thing that keeps depression going that we're going to talk about is stress generation. So the stress generation hypothesis of depression suggests that depression prone people, so people who are currently depressed or people who have, who have had previous episodes of depression and who have kind of learned this negative cognitive style are more likely to counter negative, sorry, are more likely to experience negative life events. So it's not just that people with depression perceive themselves as having more failures, more losses, more rejections, they actually do have more negative experiences than people who are not depressed. So one potential reason for this is the effect of their own cognitive style, their own negative attributions, their own mind reading, their own fortune telling, their own tendency to jump to conclusions in ways that are internal, stable, and global. So for example, if someone comes into the semester with the belief that they are a failure, so labeling themselves a failure, making a stable attribution about themselves and jumping to the conclusion that because they're a failure, they're not gonna do well this semester, making a global attribution that because I've failed in the past maybe, or because I feel like a failure, that means that I'm just never gonna do well and I'll always be a failure. If you really believe that, then why would you try really hard to do well in exams? You already know that you're gonna fail them. So you might study less and that would lead to having bad grades, which actually makes your negative prediction, the conclusion that you jump to a reality. If you label yourself as unlikable, if you make the internal attribution that you're unlikable and the prediction that you'll never make friends, you're less likely to put yourself out there and engage in social situations, and you are more likely to engage in more withdrawn behavior, which causes the prediction to come true. You miss out on opportunities to make friends, or it can put strain on your existing friendships because you're not maintaining them. So 
thinking about the same example of being in a relationship where your girlfriend is annoyed with you because you didn't do the dishes. You make these internal, stable, and global attributions about why she's mad. It's your fault. You're lazy and selfish. Things are not going to work out. It leads to emotions like feeling hopeless and self-loathing, and it leads to behaviors like not trying to change and withdrawing from the relationship. These things have interpersonal consequences. So the loved ones of people with depression experience depression too, and it tends to put a strain on relationships. So in this example, if you're feeling really help, hopeless and self-loathing and you just get, because of the way that you interpret her being mad at you, it enhances your negative emotional state and causes you to feel really upset, that might cause your girlfriend to feel like she now has to provide you with reassurance, tell you you're not the worst, tell you you're not lazy and selfish, tell you she's not gonna leave you. And she might end up feeling frustrated because what she really wanted was the dishes to be washed or a plan for how this won't happen in the future. But what she got instead was a conversation about how much you hate yourself and her needing to kind of step in and provide reassurance. So depression and this negative cognitive style, these internal stable and global attributions that are congruent with depressed mood and that result in magnifying depressed mood can put a strain on interpersonal relationships. So in saying this, it's really important to both remember that people with depression aren't helpless. The predictions that they're making about themselves don't have to come true. But at the same time, the stress generation hypothesis shouldn't be taken as victim blaming or saying that people with depression are bad people or that they're hard to be around or that their depression is their fault. Recognizing patterns like your negative cognitive style and the way that it influences your behavior in relationships is the first step in being able to take control of it, which is part of treatment for depression. But it's obviously not easy or people would just do it on their own and not need treatment. So in these examples, people with depression who make these negative internal stable and global attributions aren't making excuses for themselves. They're not trying to get out of the consequences of their behavior. They're not trying to deflect arguments about specific behaviors that they actually have control over. That's just a bias that they have. It's just the attributions that they automatically make. And there's some comorbidity involved here. So people with depression also tend to experience a lot of anxiety. And so they engage in a lot of avoidant behavior. They're actually really afraid of failure and rejection. So they engage in this kind of passive withdrawn behavior as a way of sort of not having to face the possibility that they might try and fail. That would be really anxiety provoking. It would, they predict that it would make them feel really bad and really devastated. So they avoid that possibility by withdrawing their effort, withdrawing from relationships. And that actually brings us to negative avoidant behavior, which is another precipitating, I'm sorry, another perpetuating factor in depression. So symptoms of depression include things like a lack of energy, low motivation, hard, having a hard time concentrating and making decisions, and just not enjoying things like you used to. So naturally, when people are having these symptoms, they tend to withdraw from activities. And you know, with the stress generation hypothesis and the negative attributional style that people with depression have, they also have a tendency to make really negative predictions about what will happen if they take risks or if they put themselves out there. Um, and they make negative attributions about the likelihood of failure and the likelihood of rejection that lead them to be kind of motivated to avoid situations where they might fail or where they might be rejected. So the symptoms of depression, the cognitive style and cognitive distortions involved in depression kind of come together to lead to avoidant withdrawn behavior. This actually creates a vicious cycle though, because the more you withdraw, the fewer opportunities you have for positive experiences. If you're depressed, it makes you more likely to wanna to stay home. But if you actually went out and spent time with your friends, you might have more chances to feel positive affect. You might have more chances to feel included. You might be reminded more that people actually do like you, that your friends really miss you and want you to be around more. You won't have the opportunity to learn that and to help start to disprove your cognitive distortions just like a behavioral experiment for social anxiety, if you stay in the house and withdraw. Also, the lack of activity, the lack of physical activity in depression contributes to disturbances in sleep. One of the first person perspective videos really addressed that when she talked about how she just kind of stayed in bed and slept on and off all day. And that meant that it was really hard to sleep at night. 
So physical inactivity and a lack of exercise, also a lack of sun exposure from not going outside can make the sleep disturbances and the circadian dysfunction and depression worse. So these are two examples of how the tendency to avoid and withdraw actually perpetuates the symptoms of depression. So going out of the house, putting yourself in situations where you risk failure or risk rejection gives you more opportunities to learn that those risks are worth it because there's positive experiences too, or that the rejection and failure that your cognitive distortions lead you to believe will happen is actually not that likely. Again, a lot like behavioral experiments and social anxiety disorder. So lastly, another parallel to anxiety disorders is the cognitive process of rumination. This is the last perpetuating factor we're gonna talk about in this lecture. So as a reminder, when we talked about GAD in the anxiety disorders unit, I emphasized that unlike the other anxiety disorders, GAD is less characterized by fear and more characterized by distress. So more general negative affect than just this really specific focal fear response to certain situations. GAD actually shares this feature with other disorders, including major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is also characterized by kind of generalized distress. Sadness, definitely, but also a lot of anxiety and also a lot of irritability and anger. So the similarities between depression and GAD don't stop there. They both involve negative emotion, but they also both involve persistent distressing thoughts that contribute to the negative mood. And they both involve um, beliefs about control and danger. In depression, the beliefs are that because of internal stable and global attributions that I'm gonna fail, people are not gonna like me, negative things are gonna happen because that's just the kind of person I am and the kind of things that happen to me. So that leads to not taking risks. It leads to negative avoidant behavior. The persistent distressing thoughts are worry in the case of generalized anxiety disorder and rumination in the case of depression. So that brings us to kind of the key differences. One of the most important differences, definitely like experientially the most important difference for people who have these disorders is the experience and the presence of positive emotion. So People with GAD and people with depression both experience a lot of negative emotion, but people with depression are impaired in their ability to feel positive emotion. People with depression tend to feel flat affect or really negative affect, but they don't tend to have um, very many experiences of positive affect. People with GAD can experience affect at both ends of the spectrum. They can be euthymic and they can be happy while also being having a lot of negative affect and having a lot of anxiety, sadness, and um, irritability. So the experience of positive emotion is really probably the most important difference between depression and generalized anxiety disorder. But another important difference is also the, the focus of the negative repetitive thoughts. So the focus of worry as a negative repetitive thought is the future. So thinking about all the bad things that could possibly happen, thinking about all the ways that a situation could go wrong, thinking about all of the things that could make you feel upset as a way of kind of mitigating the huge emotional contrast that you would have when you went from feeling happy to feeling upset. Rumination in depression is a really similar cognitive process. It's repetitive circular thinking about a problem that enhances negative mood. But whereas worry is really focused on the future, rumination is focused on the past. But just like worry, rumination really is just an example of problem solving gone wrong. So just like worry, rumination interacts with negative cognitive styles and mood states. So people with generalized anxiety disorder experience a lot of cognitive distortions that increase their anxiety level. Whereas people with um, depression experience cognitive distortions that increase their negative affect, their sadness during the process of rumination. Whereas worry is perseverative, repetitive thinking about the future, rumination is perseverative thinking about past failures and past losses, thinking about all the things that have gone wrong in the past. Because people, because people with depression tend to have this negative attributional style, when people with depression ruminate and think about their past failures and losses, they tend to experience cognitive distortions that make them that cause them to make internal, stable, and global attributions about the reasons for those past failures and losses. 
So thinking about a breakup in the past, they might think, well, this happened because I'm unlovable, I'm annoying, I'm hard to be around, people just don't really like me. That's an example of an internal stable and global attribution about a negative event that happened in the past. Similar to worry in GAD, people with depression know that they're depressed and they know that they're, the way that they're thinking contributes to that. So they often engage in processes really similar to thought suppression, like this illustration is showing, trying to force themselves to stop thinking negative thoughts, to stop repetitively thinking about the past. Just like trying to suppress thoughts about the future and thoughts about white bears, trying to suppress any thought leads to thought rebound and actually makes those thoughts come back even stronger. So just like solving problems about the future and anticipating and preventing future danger is an adaptive function of worry. Figuring out what, what went wrong in the past and trying to figure out what you could do differently in the future is an adaptive function of normal sadness. But in depression, this process has basically lost its adaptive functioning. It just becomes a standalone repetitive process that the person tries to suppress but finds it really difficult to control. So to put it all together, you can think of learned helplessness as kind of a transition. It, learned helplessness is a way that having constant chronic stress and lots of negative life events that you really can't control or that you feel like you had no control over can lead to the development of a negative cognitive style. If bad things have consistently happened to you, it might not be that unreasonable to make stable and global attributions. To think, you know, I, I always fail or people always leave me isn't necessarily unrealistic if you grew up in an abusive household where you were constantly told that you were a failure or a bad person. So learned helplessness is one way that prolonged stress can lead to the development of a negative cognitive style. Once that negative cognitive style is developed, cognitive distortions and the tendency to interpret events in negative and mood congruent ways leads to making internal stable and global attributions about negative events. So interpreting negative life events through this filter that makes you come to the conclusion that this happened because of me, it's always gonna be like this and it's gonna be like this in every situation. That way of thinking actually can promote avoidant helpless behavior and it can gener generate a lot of stress in interpersonal relationships. So having this negative cognitive style can actually increase the likelihood of failure and increase avoidant behavior and, and withdrawal leading to a lack of positive experiences and fewer experiences that actually help to disprove these negative beliefs about yourself and this tendency to interpret events in a negative way. So negative avoidant behavior is the tendency of depressed people, a symptom of depression, to want to withdraw from life. The more you withdraw, the more you avoid activities and opportunities for failure and rejection, the fewer opportunities you'll have to increase your positive affect, to have fun, and to disprove your negative attributions and cognitive distortions, to give yourself opportunities to prove to yourself that you're not a failure, that people actually like you. And putting it all together, rumination is a repetitive thought process that leads people to kind of constantly, chronically engage in this negative style of thinking about past failures that really reinforces the negative cognitive style and the negative beliefs about themselves. So a few takeaways. What perpetuates depression is really these interacting cognitive and behavioral processes. In most cases, the first episode of depression involves an event, is precipitated by an event that would provoke sadness and negative mood in anyone. But people who have perpetuating factors who engage in behavioral avoidance and these negative cognitive styles are more likely to perseverate on that negative life event and to kind of get stuck in that negative mood state in a way that turns into major depressive disorder. Having one major depressive episode kind of teaches these cognitive processes and this tendency to avoid and withdraw in response to sadness and depression. And that actually makes it more likely that future life stressors, even ones that might initially seem relatively minor, can be magnified by this negative cognitive style and this tendency to withdraw and avoid in response to negative life events, 
And this creates more likelihood of recurrent depression and relapses in the future. So the takeaways, because I know this was kind of a complicated lecture, the relevant predisposing factors for depression are factors that influence the functioning of the circadian system, the monoamine system, and the HPA axis. Stress, per, per, blah, sorry, stress precipitates depression, but stressors are more important in first episodes than in recurrences, and that's because of the lasting impact of stress on the biological vulnerability, particularly the HPA axis and the hippocampus and on cognitive style and the tendency to withdraw and avoid, which are the relevant perpetuating factors in depression. Okay, that is it. I will see you guys in class.